Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to VSPG. Today, we have a presentation by Dr. Dr. Maud Boyette from Claremont Auvergne University. Um, the talk is titled the, oh, sorry, Maud. I was planning on reading it right off of your slide. <laughs> Yes, it's titled The Origin of the Earth and Its Early Silicate Evolution. Next week we'll hear from uh next week we'll hear from Raimo Latinen. And his talk is titled Paleoproterozoic Tectonics of Phenoscandia. Um and uh, so I don't have any announcements, but we We have An Andre is going to introduce Maud for us today. So Andre, please go ahead and introduce Maud. And Maud, um, you can go ahead and share your screen. It's a pleasure to introduce Maud Boyet. Uh, Maud uh, did PhD in Ecolin Normal Superior de Leon. Uh, working with uh, Francis Albarade, and at that time she started to work on Samarium Neodymium system uh, on Hadean rocks from uh, Ishua Greenstone Belt. Uh, she continued this work as a postdoc at Carnegie Institution of Washington, working with uh, Rich Carlson, and we published uh, uh, in 2005 science paper that uh, sort of focused on uh, differentiation of Earth and probably part of uh, research that she will continue now, as uh, she will discuss today. Uh, she returned to France uh, uh, first as a uh, working in the uh, University of Saint Etienne, but uh, when getting a junior research position at CNRS and um, in 2016, she became a senior researcher in CNRS, and she is based at University Clermont Auvergne. And her research is focused on chronology of early solar system, uh, planetary differentiation, nucleosynthetic anomalies, and solar system formation, and long-term evolution of silicate Earth. Uh, so with this, uh, welcome, Maud, and take over. Okay, thanks. Uh, so I'm very pleased to present. Okay, Maud, you. Maud, for some yeah? reason, we lost your screen share. Okay. Okay, perfect. It's okay? Yeah, all set. Thank you. Okay, I'm sorry. It's okay. So, uh, yes, I'm an isotope geochemist, and I'm working on the early Earth or the Earth, the terrestrial mantle, but also on the formation of the solar system and the differentiation. So, no. Now I'm in Lyon, uh, so in this city in Clermont-Ferrand that is very close to Lyon. So if you are coming uh, for the next Goldschmidt, it will be close to, to Clermont-Ferrand. So in fact, um, we can see that during the early evolution of embryos, I'm sorry, um, planetesimal and planet, um, has known a different uh, important melting event, and these melting events are called magma ocean. So in fact, we think that shortly after the beginning of a solar system formation, so in small planetesimal, we have a large melting event, and this melting is induced by the presence of short life radionuclides and mostly the presence of 26 aluminum. After both the gravitational energy liberated by accretion and core segregation will enhance significantly the temperature. And in the final stage of accretion, we'll have large collision 
and this can uh, produce also a uh, large uh, magma ocean. So we think we can have several magma ocean stages during planetary formation. So in fact, this concept of magma ocean uh, come from uh, the moon, so just after the Apollo mission. So Wood et al. in 1970 uh, were the first to suggest that the anorthositic crust, so the uh, anorthositic rocks that uh, were sampled during the Apollo mission, could be the remnant of the earliest lunar crust formed by crystal fractionation and plagioclase flotation during the crystallization of the lunar magma ocean. So here we have a picture of the moon and we can see these two different types of rocks, these uh, white samples that represent the lunar island and they are ferron and orthosite. And we have also this basalt that we can find here uh, in this uh, lunar maria. And in fact, if we look at the uh, chemical composition, so here we have the truss element, so the war earth element pattern, for the different mantle region, we can see that we have a strong europium anomaly in the island crust, so in the anorthosite. So that means that when this uh, mantle sample reservoir were formed, the lunar crust were, were, was already present uh, on the moon. So this is uh, very important uh, and uh, it's a strong evidence for uh, uh, lunar magma ocean. So in fact, the crystallization of the lunar magma ocean is predicted to have produced different chemical reservoirs. So first, we have dense uh, mafic cumulates, so mostly olivine and pyroxene. And after some 70 to 80 percent of crystallization, the plagioclase uh, began to crystallize and float to form this thick lunar crust. And we uh, continue the crystallization. And in the final stage of the crystallization, we have this quip reservoir. So this is the last liquid to solidify at the end of the crystallization. And this reservoir is extremely enriched in incompatible element. So in potassium, in war of element, and in phosphorus. And if we look also at uh, smaller planetary bodies, so for example, here I would like to show you the isotopic composition of oxygen in obrite. So we think that this obrite, they are achondrite, are suited to represent achondrite derived from an unstatite chondrite power one body. And in fact, if we see the uh, capital uh, 70 oxygen in obrite, we can see that the value. Uh, are, uh, are comprised in the very small range. However, the power and body uh, show a large dispersion of value. So we can say that obrite are formed from an homogeneous reservoir. And this, uh, with this, we can say that the obrite power and body underwent a global scale oxygen isotope homogenization event. And we think that uh, this body uh, known uh, melting event, so magma ocean stage, probably very early in the solar system evolution. And we think that is due to the presence of 26 alumina. So in fact, we would like to understand the early evolution of the Earth, but it's very difficult because we have no uh, evidence or no big evidence for uh, very old work. So it is very difficult to study this early uh, stage of evolution. So I would like to speak more about the ADN because in fact, the Earth's surface is very young. So if we look, 80% of ages are younger than 200 million years because we have an oceanic crust, but we have very old continental crust but they are scarce. But we can find uh, very old samples uh, coming from Australia, Antarctica, South Africa, China, and we have complex in, uh, in, uh, in Greenland and also in, in Canada. 
But that's true that if we compare, uh, for example, with the moon, it's striking to see that for the moon, 80% of ages are older than 4 billion years. So of course, it's very easy to study the early differentiation of the moon, even if we have a few samples, but uh, it's much more easy that for the earth because samples are younger and uh, they have known a complex uh, history. So in fact, if we look at this uh, at this graph, I'm sorry, that show um, the work record in function to, to death. So we can see that, okay, today we have a very good uh, evidence. We have a ton of geophysical data. So the, the inner part of the, the mantle is well known. But in fact, when we uh, go back through time, it's very difficult to constrain uh, this period. For that, we can study radioactive system in the oldest rock samples because this system can, can reverse major differentiation events uh, that accompany Earth formation. So I'm going to focus my talk on uh, these very old samples, but I would like to mention, and maybe we can discuss that after in the discussion, that maybe it's possible that early form reservoirs are preserved today from mental convection, and that maybe we can find this reservoir here uh, very uh, close to the core mental boundary. So I know that there is a lot of study and uh, discussion about the possibility that we store early form reservoir in this part of the mental. So in fact, we have different uh, isotopic system to study this, this part, I mean, this, this ADN area. We have short life systematics and two of them are very interesting because the half life is, uh, is not too, too short. So the hafnium tungsten systematics with the half life of nine million years and the samarium, so the 146 samarium 142 neodymium systematics with half life of 100 million years. So, um, in fact, these systems are alive during five half life. So, this is shown here. So, I'm sorry for that. Uh, so, in fact, we see that we have the decay of the parent isotopes. And after five half life, the parent isotope uh, is extinct. So, it's um, important to study this systematics because five half life covers the ADN period covers the, the first 500 million years of uh, Earth history. But we have also uh, long life systematics. So two uh, systematics are important and I'm going to speak uh, mostly about this systematics. So the lutetium hafnium and the samarium neodymium, so the long life systematics. And they have the most useful tracer to understand the early silica differentiation process because they are less prone to um, be modified uh, during secondary processes. I mean, uh, fluid circulation and a temperature uh, during metamorphism. I'm not going to talk about this systematics. It's very important to study the early evolution of the Earth. But in fact, it's a little bit complicated because hafnium is lithophile, but tungsten is siderophile. So the major fractionation between these two elements are explained by core formation. So um, we can discuss and we try to interpret the variation in 82 uh, tungsten, but it can uh, come from core formation or core mental exchange and also silicate differentiation and, light, and late accretion. So I'm not going to include uh, this discussion today in my presentation. And um, it's very good, in fact, because we have two systematics with the samarium neodymium systematics. We have a short life systematics and a long life systematics. So, in fact, we can combine these two uh, study to better constrain the fractionation. Because, in fact, when we study uh, a systematics, we will measure the variation in, uh, in the... Um, in the daughter isotopes, but in fact, the amplitude of the neodymium isotopic variation depends on two factors, the age of the fractionation 
but also the magnitude of the power and daughter fractionation. But because we will have two systems, it will be possible uh, to decouple to this these two effects and to uh, better constrain the age of the fractionation. So of course, the variation, I mean the variation in uh, neodymium is higher for a reservoir fractionated earlier. So the 142 neodymium anomaly increase also with the magnitude of the samarium neodymium fractionation. So here I present a plot where we can couple the two systematics. So here it's a short life systematics and here is a long life systematics. Of course, if you have no fractionation, we will provide, we will form no anomaly. But if we have a fractionation and the fractionation factor is noted here by this uh, value, so if I increase the fractionation factor, I have a higher anomaly. And I have also this effect of timing. If I produce a fractionation very close to the solar system formation, I will have also a strong anomaly. So by coupling these two systematic, I can resolve these two equations. And in this case, we can like calculate a model age of fractionation so, for example, if I have sample that plot along this line, I can say that the fractionation occurred 100 million years after uh, the beginning of solar system formation. So, it's what we call planetary isochrome. So, the age of the fractionation event can be calculated because I have results coming from these two uh, isotopes. Of course, we have a strong assumption because we consider that the source has not been modified between the first fractionation event, so for example here, 100 million years, and the age of my samples. So for the Earth, we have, I mean, very uh, young samples because they are mostly Archean. So it's different, for example, for, like uh, for the Moon. But uh, we have to assume that there is no modification in the source between the two events. So in fact, I can construct I can construct a model. I see uh, I have an evolution from the, the beginning of solar system formation to like an ADN differentiation event, and I will be able to calculate this uh, value after I have a second event. And here, this is the age of the rock crystallization. So from today, I'm able to. Um, to have uh, the value uh, for, uh, for the work crystallization. And after that, I can uh, find uh, this age of uh, ADN differentiation event. So in fact, for the uh, variation in 142 neodymium, we use this notation, which is a mu uh, notation because the deviations are very small. So here I'm um, using this notation uh, because in fact the deviation are uh, like PPM deviation. So they are very small and to make this calculation, I measure my samples and I measure also this well, one terrestrial standard. So I use and uh, most of the lab use the same standard. Then, so you, we, we use this ratio that we measure for the standard and we normalize the value that we measure in the samples by this value. And in fact, it seems that this value represents the uh, modern mantle because if we plot all uh, these samples that represent a mantle derived sample, we can find that they all plot uh, close to zero. And um, this minus plus five ppm represents the external reproducibility that we obtain when we measure this standard several times. So uh, we agree that today the value is zero for the modern mantle. So this is just to show uh, the amplitude of the anomaly uh, in comparison to the precision we obtain uh, with the mass spectrometer. So uh, here I present calculation for fractionation event. So here you have a fractionation uh, event at zero. So I change the samarium neodymium ratio of the source. And I can see that I have different 
anomaly. So when the samarium neodymium is high, I have a higher anomaly, okay, because I changed my samarium neodymium ratio. And if I make the same calculation, but at 200 million years, we can see that the deviation is very small. Why? Because in fact, at 200 million years, one, uh, a large part of my 146 tamarium uh, is still alive. Okay. So um, even if I change the samarium neodymium ratio, the amplitude of the anomaly will be very small. And in fact, it's important to see that this is my analytical precision. So in fact, I can use this system mostly to um, constrain differentiation event occurring during the first two or 300 million years, but not after that because the variation will be too small and I have not the precision to uh, measure uh, such a small variation. So, so this is a compilation of all the data that have been measured, so maybe during the past uh, 20 years, on a mass spectrometer on Archean samples. So I'm in Archean, and we can discuss about these samples that are samples from the Nouveau Architecture Western Belt. So the first paper published by Jonathan O'Neill, um, maybe 15 years ago now. And um, I have represented the different quaternion with different color, but um, all the samples from one quaternion have the same symbol. There is no difference between mafic sample or facial sample. So if we consider that we have a precision of maybe minus plus three or five ppm, we can say that yes. 142 neodymium anomalies are measured in Archean samples from different cretons. We can see excess that are resolved here. Um, all these samples are coming from Isua, supracrystal bed, so in uh, southwest Greenland. But we have also many samples with deficit in 142 neodymium. So we have samples from a new rabbitic supracrystal belt. We have also samples from Antarctica. We have samples from uh, Africa, South Africa, so the Cabal Quaton, and uh, Acasta and different Quaton. So that shows that during the ADN, different silicate reservoirs were formed because if I produce a 142 neodymium anomaly, that means that I change the samarium neodymium ratio of the source during the ADN. And to better understand, in fact, um, if I have a crystal reservoir, so I produce a melt, it will be a crystal reservoir. This reservoir has a low samarium neodymium ratio, and I will obtain with time a deficit in 142 neodymium. If I have a depleted reservoir, this reservoir has a high samarium neodymium ratio, and if I have a high samarium neodymium ratio, I will produce excess in 142 neodymium. So we can see that the largest 142 neodymium anomalies, so the excesses, are measured in sample from Greenland. And of course, we can say that to produce all this deficit in 142 neodymium, that means that we need to have a crust that is formed very early, probably close to 4.4 billion. So this is in agreement with uh, all the studies that measure, for example, hafnium on zircon, because they can also constrain the fractionation between lutetium and hafnium. So this is to show you the amplitude of the 142 anomaly if we compare the Earth uh, with uh, Mars, Moon, and here it's for Vesta, so it's an asteroid. And we have uh, several meteorites meteorite that we think are coming that from that from for Vesta. So of course, here we have very big anomaly in comparison to the Earth, but we think that um, this asteroid has known a magma ocean stage very early. So maybe two, three, five billion year, million years after the beginning of solar system formation. But we can also see that for Mars, we have large 
142 neodymium anomaly because we are close to 80 ppm here with excess and also large deficits. If we try to calculate the age of differentiation with the systematics for Mars, we are close to 40 or 50 million years. And for the Moon and the Earth, we can say that 142 neodymium anomaly are very, very, very small. Okay. So just looking at this value, we can say that the Earth Mars system is different. And probably because, because the silicate differentiation is relatively young for the Moon and for the Earth. So to better constrain this, uh, this uh, early evolution, it's important to note that um, during the, the last 10 or even 15 years, um, we have used the nucleosynthetic anomaly, so which has mass independent stable isotope ratio, so variation, um, to understand um, the link between the primitive solar system object. So here I present two plots. So here it's titanium, chromium, oxygen, chromium. And we can see that we have two different groups. Okay. So these groups is called carbonaceous, and this group is called non-carbonaceous. And in fact, we have uh, like a fundamental dichotomy between these two groups. So the Earth is here. So it's formed in the non-carbonaceous group. And we think that all these uh, samples or the power and body of these samples form in the inner solar system. And uh, for the carbonaceous uh, samples, so uh, chondrite, but also achondrite, we think that they form in the outer part of the solar system. And uh, Roger et al. in this paper uh, propose that this dichotomy is possible because we have the early growth of Jupiter that uh, divide, in fact, the solar system in two different areas. But in fact, what we see is that we have variation. So maybe it's important also for neodymium. And uh, for all this graph, we can note that the Earth is here and the Earth is different from ordinary chondrite and is closer to unstatite chondrite. It's exactly the same for this diagram. We have Earth, unstatite chondrite, and in fact, there is no, very, there is no difference between uh, unstatite chondrite, Earth, and Moon if we consider the, the, the error we have on the different symbols. So this study, um, give very important information because in fact, they focus on molybdenum isotopes. So molybdenum isotopes are uh, isotopes formed by S process uh, during the nucleosynthesis. And in fact, if we look at the terrestrial value, so the earth is here at zero, and here we have the unstatite chondrite and the ordinary chondrite. So we see that the earth is different from unstatite chondrite. So in this paper, they say that compared to chondrite, Earth is enriched in S process, and Earth cannot be reconstructed by any known combination of meteorites, implying that chondrite may be inappropriate proxy for the isotopic composition of the bulk Earth. But I'm an isotope geochemist, and I need a value, uh, I mean, for the starting point. I need to know the isotopic composition of the Earth, to model its evolution. And it's important because, in fact, the 142 neodymium is also an S process isotopes. So, this is very important because, yes, I know the value of the Earth today, but in fact, what is this starting point? And we need to define the initial 142 neodymium isotopic composition of the Earth in order to model its early evolution. So in this paper, and is based on molybdenum, they propose that the Earth form here, I mean, very close to the sun, and uh, that this reservoir is enriched in S process. 
But in this case, I have no samples to give the information of the initial state of the, uh, of the off. And that's true. If we look at the different group of chondrites for the 142 neodymium isotopic composition, I see variation. So here you have the result for carbonaceous chondrite, ordinary chondrite, and unstatite chondrite. So for most of isotopes, we can say that unstatite chondrite are very close to the Earth. Yeah, it's the same. They are the closest to the Earth, but they are a little bit different. Okay, I have a, a, a mean value of minus 9 ppm um, here if I consider the average value. And all these samples have similar samarium neodymium ratio. So in fact, when I measure the isotopic composition today, it's the sum of two different parameters. The initial value, I consider that it's a nucleosynthetic term, and the radiogenic value, so this is the disintegration of the 146. So if I change the samarium neodymium ratio, I will change uh, the production, the radiogenic production, and I will change this term. Okay, so you have, I have two different terms. Looking at this result for the chondrite, they have different value today, but they have the same similar samarium neodymium ratio. So we think that the difference is due to the nucleosynthetic anomaly. Uh, so I mean the different reservoirs where they form in the solar system. So we need to better understand the distribution of neodymium isotopes in solar system materials. Because if we want to use the 146, 142 neodymium power meter for modeling the Earth evolution, we need to know exactly uh, where is the starting point. So neodymium and samarium I produce by different uh, stellar nucleosynthesis. I'm not going to give too uh, much detail about that, but just to uh, focus on the 142 neodymium, so it's an S process isotopes, maybe 96% is produced by S process. And if we try to make the calculation, so for this calculation, we use uh, the nucleosynthetic process abundances reported in this paper. We can try to calculate the deviation that we obtain if we uh, increase the quantity of S process, for example. So we can see that if we have an excess of S process, okay, I will have an excess in 142 neodymium. But if I have an excess of 142 neodymium, I should be able to measure a deficit in 145 and a deficit in 148 and 150. Okay, so uh, it's important to measure these isotopes to be able to constrain this one because in fact, the 142 can be produced by the nucleosynthesis, but also by disintegration. So we develop a method to measure with very high precision this uh, stable isotope of neodymium. So the 148, 140, uh, 149, 148, 150. So this is a paper that we published last year in September. Uh, so Paul Frossard was in PhD here in Clermont-Ferrand. And we tried to reconstruct the 142 neodymium signature of the bulk curve. Uh, from the measurement of uh, these uh, different isotopes. And we realize a stepwise dissolution of chondrite. So that means that uh, we use different acid, and each time we uh, uptake um, what we dissolve, and we measure the neodymium isotopic composition, and we work on uh, or one ordinary chondrite, two unstatite chondrite, and one carbonaceous chondrite. So in fact, what we want to do is to measure the composition with high precision in the different uh, leaching of 148 and 150 to have this type of graph, so I mean, and to define the slope, okay? So you can see that we have large variation. In 142 for the terrestrial sample, it's maybe 10, 15 ppm. So here we have very large variation. And you can see this point, so it's not reported here, but this point, it's the residue of orgue. So 
what we collect for the last dissolution with very extreme uh, value. So um, with all this data, so we have the one, um, 145 relative to 148 and 148 relative to 142. Okay, so we obtain a slope and we can uh, try to um, look at this slope relative to the estimate that we have uh, for the S process astrophysical estimate. So all these slopes are represented here. So uh, that means that all the lead shades are consistent. But for example, here, we are different from astrophysical estimates. OK? This point looks different, but it's for ordinary chondrite. And in fact, here, the error bar represents uh, the error we have on the slope. And we have a big error because there is no difference between the leaching. Okay, so it's not it's not possible to define a slope for this sample. It's different for uh, the the unsatite chondrite and the in the carbonaceous chondrite. So with this uh, study, now it's possible to define the isotopic composition of the Earth because we know the composition in one forty five and one forty eight. And it's possible to calculate uh, the value for the 142. So if I try to do that for these two uh, stable isotopes, so uh, we measure also uh, achondrite, and we see that we have a good resolution. So this is the line from the non carbonaceous reservoir. The Earth is enriched in, in S process. And OK, we agree that we cross here, the value for the Earth mantle. Okay, so I know how to correct for the S process nucleosynthetic anomaly because I uh, have value um, that have def that are defined uh, from the regression. But if I do the same for the one forty two neodymium, in fact, I can say that the Earth is here. But the Earth is not here. The Earth today is here. So we have a difference of 8 ppm between the value that uh, we calculate and the value that we measured. And to explain this difference, in fact, we propose that this is a radiogenic excess. This difference is not due to nucleosynthetic anomaly, but is due to the production of 142 neodymium by disintegration. So we have a value that is uh, constrained. So it's 7, 9 uh, ppm. So we have a very small error. And we can also show that for achondrite, some of them present also an excess, so a radiogenic excess in 142 uh, compared to this uh, theoretical uh, non carbonaceous reservoir. And in fact, a few weeks after we published this paper, another paper published, so in Nature, uh, proposed exactly the same value. They define a, a difference of uh, 7.3 7 ppm. So we are in perfect agreement uh, between these two studies. So in fact, in this paper, we propose that the Earth composition was modified by collisional erosion. So that means that it's a very early stage of differentiation during the accretion. So this is a sketch of collisional erosion scenario on planetesimal in Earth. So we propose that, um, in fact, we have differentiation in a planetesimal that produce crust. This crust have low uh, samarium neodymium ratio. And we have a collision. These crusts are removed during this collision. And in fact, we continue the accretion with depleted reservoir. Okay, so this is the mantle. We have no crust. That means that we change the samarium neodymium ratio of the bulk um, planetesimal. And this planetesimal continue to accrete to form the Earth. So today we have a non-chondritic bulk Earth. For samarium neodymium, we can say that it's not the chondritic composition. 
Um, so the second part of my talk, so it's always a focus on uh, isotope geochemistry, but I think it's, it's important to show you how we can couple um, the different systematics to better understand the differentiation. So here, uh, it's just to present that we can use the mineral melt partition coefficient for upper and lower mantle phases, okay? We have value, so it's difficult to have value for, um, for these uh, high pressure phases, but we have value for trust element coming from the experimental petrology. And in fact, if we look the process for the upper mantle, the mineralogy for the upper mantle, we have always the same step. That means that for both systematics, lutetium hafnium and samarium neodymium, the daughter element, so neodymium and hafnium, are more incompatible than parent elements. So this behavior explains this positive correlation that we observe today for hafnium and neodymium in modern terrestrial uh, basalt. Now, if I look the partition coefficient for lower mantle minerals, it's completely different. So samarium, neodymium, and lutetium hafnium can be decoupled when deep mantle mineral phases are involved. Why? Because bridgmanite here in a red here has a different slope. And this mineral is the only abundant mantle mineral that preferentially concentrate hafnium relative to lutetium. So if we try to model uh, like the magma ocean crystallization, we can see that it's possible to have like a decoupling of the two systematics. So samarium, neodymium, and lutetium hafnium, we can see that the slope is different here and here, are decoupled when Bridgmanite proportion except 77% so more than that, in the mixture of Bridgmanite ferropericlase and calcium perovskite. So if we try to constrain uh, and to use this, mineral this mineralogy, we can say that if we have lower mental cumulates, we are in this field, okay? So we will have a negative hafnium, uh, epsilon hafnium isotopic composition because the lutetium hafnium is very low, and the residual liquid are located in this part of the graph. And in this case, we have positive epsilon uh, hafnium and negative epsilon neodymium. So it's possible to completely decouple uh, these two systematics. And now, if we try to do a similar calculation for uh, upper mantle cumulate, in fact, we can see that uh, we do not um, follow this correlation, but we can fractionate uh, the lutetium hafnium and because uh, we have a lot of garnet. Okay, so this is described in this paper uh, by Moreno. So now if we look at the results we have on, on terrestrial samples, so I'm just going to, to show you a few uh, examples. So, um, so 10 years ago, we, we published this paper. And in fact, we measured so the three systematics, so the short life and the long life samarium neodymium systematics and the lutetium hafnium systematics. We show that for the samarium neodymium systematics, we have positive value. Positive value, that means that we are in this field. However, the initial uh, epsilon uh, hafnium is negative, okay? These two values have been defined uh, considering uh, the isocode method. So that means that we are in this field and we uh, interpreted this um, isotopic uh, value uh, saying that the mental source of ISUA has recorded the crystallization of a deep magma ocean. So now we have different evidence. So um, two papers that focus on um, a combination of measurement of these three systems on Scapenburg, Comatiite, and Comati. And we think that we are on this part of the graph. And um, all the value that we measure are interpreted as it's the same, like 
we can uh, constrain the crystallization of the magma ocean. And also uh, two different studies that uh, have measured, uh, so here, lutetium afnium and samarium neodymium. Uh, here it's the same, but there is no data for the 142 neodymium. And uh, it's the same conclusion. They find that they are not on this correlation and uh, they conclude that uh, the source of this uh, mental, of these samples has recorded the crystallization of uh, a magma ocean. So to conclude, I would like to present uh, this graph. So we published this uh, in, a, in a paper. Um, so I think that uh, we have a lot of evidence to say that, okay, we have no work record for the first uh, 150 million years of Earth's history. But in fact, when you make calculation for the differentiation of the Earth or the differentiation of the Moon, we have exactly the same timing. So these are the planetary isochrones, and we are, we are always close to 4.4 or 4.35. So that means that um, the earliest stage of differentiation was aroused by the giant impact forming the moon. And the second conclusion, it's for the bulk silicate Earth composition. So uh, we propose that uh, this composition has been modified so very early by a collisional erosion. But that means that the bulk silicate earth is not chondritic, but slightly depleted in incompatible element, in incompatible element, I'm sorry. And uh, so with I, samarium neodymium ratio. So it's important uh, when you, we use um, isotope systematics, but also we expect a significant loss of other incompatible elements, including very important in producing elements like uranium, thorium, or potassium. So that, that should change the long-term heat production. So the mental source of Archean works from different locations have recorded the crystallization of the terrestrial magma ocean. And uh, Isua, uh, I think it's a very good example. And um, so this is just to, to show you. So in general, we use this, um, this graph to look at the evolution of the mantle and the crystal reservoir to time. And it's always expressed relative to the chondritic value. Today, we know that maybe the primitive mantle was a little bit different because the samarium neodymium is not chondritic for the Earth. So the evolution will be more like that. So, of course, I would like to <laughs> acknowledge a lot of people. Marion Garçon, because we are working on a chapter for the new edition of the Treatise of Geochemistry. So it's in preparation all my former students and postdoc and uh, wonderful colleagues and of course uh, the LMV staff. Um, thank you for your attention. Thanks, Maud. Uh, it was great. We're now going to switch to the discussion and questions. Um, you can ask either by raising your hand virtually or by typing your question in the chat and I can ask it for you. Uh, we have one from earlier that I have from Kaysundur Sarwan. How do cosmogenic nuclides affect 142 neodymium ratios or short-lived systematics? I'm sorry. Um, so we have no problem for, of course, what was we have samples. Uh, when we work on lunar samples, for example, um, so here, um, we have to apply a correction. So in general, we measure the samarium isotopic composition to, to see the difference. And after we apply a correction, um, not all the sample has been affected, but maybe all of them. And yeah, the correction can, can be large, maybe 20 or 25 ppm. So for the moon, yeah, we have to be careful about this effect. OK. see. We don't have any questions in the chat or answers uh, at the moment. Maybe I can start, Maud. Um, 
Uh, so, so just looking on this uh, diagram, um, you emphasize that there is much larger spread for moon compared to Earth in mu 142 neodymium, which um, I thought you explained by a different time of separation, different time of formation of silicate uh, crust on moon versus Earth. Uh, but when you came back in conclusions that uh, moon and earth formed from the same reservoir through collision, so how does it uh, kind of fit together? Um, in fact, we have big difference between Mars and <laughs> the Earth-Moon system. The Earth-Moon system, if you look at the, the amplitude of the variation, is not, is not very different. Um, a little bit more here relative to, to the Earth, I agree. Um, but in the same time, I know that the different reservoirs that we form on the Moon have not been modified during the crystallization and the, the, the rock sample formation because there is no convection, in fact. So I think it's a little bit different for the Earth. So maybe we, we, we mix a little bit the different reservoir. But yeah, if we calculate like this planetary isochrone for the Earth and for the Moon, we are very close. And I think it's not very resolved because we have error. And like I, I try to say here, it's, it's here, it's, we calculate, but it's a model age okay, so with assumption. So I'm not sure that uh, it's very evident to see a difference of, uh, of 50 million years. But yes, when we look at uh, this calculation for the moon and, and, and the earth, it, we have very close um, slope and the slope gives the age. Okay, thank you. Okay, do we have any more questions? Okay, Paul, go ahead. Um, if I remember correctly from 20 years or so ago, it was thought that the moon forming impact occurred within 30 to 100 million years after solar system formation um, based on um, tungsten isotopes. And the uncertainty was about uh, the value of epsilon tungsten. Now, I gather from your talk, it's now thought that uh, the moon forming impact could have been um, significantly younger than that. Is that, am I correct in, uh, in, in that inference? Um, so here I try to add the different, I mean, the constraint we can try to discuss, okay? So here are planetary isochrone. So I think that uh, I have an age for the differentiation, for the crystallization of the magma ocean. So this is the age we obtain on ferroanorthosite. So this is the age of the cross formation, okay? And these are a model age for the long life systematics. But this is also the differentiation of the lunar interior. So I think that this is robust, okay? We have the same age. The question that we can maybe have is to say, um, is it possible that the crystallization has been delayed after the moon formation? And yes, I think it's possible. It's possible if you have like this thick crust, like it will be, uh, and after that, it's difficult to, um, to make the solidification because the, the temperature is too high. So some people discuss this difference but I think that yes, today we think that the, the, the giant impact is, is young in fact. So it's not 4.5. Some people say that maybe it's 4.45, uh, but it's, it's young, yeah. Thank you. Okay, we have a question from Dan Davis, please go ahead. I sent you a request to unmute yourself. Sorry, you were muted. 
Right. Okay. Uh, given the fact that uh, samarium is uh, more volatile than neodymium, and the fact that both the Earth and the Moon have mu values, uranium over lead, that are substantially higher than chondritic, do you think it's possible that the uh, 142 anomaly is due to loss of uh, uh, samarium due to, due to evaporation, basically, during the, the collisional event rather than uh, collisional erosion of an earlier crust? Um, I would say no. <laughs> uh -huh. No, I, I don't think so. Um, so here, what we try, because in my lab, we have like a, a group of experimental petrology. So the first experiment was to be, we wanted to be sure that there was no fractionation induced by core formation. And also because in, for example, in non-statite chondrite, in fact, uh, the samarium neodymium is not lithophile. They are not concentrated in, in silicate, but in, in sulfide. So we tried to make this experiment. And in fact, uh, there was no possibility to fractionate the samarium neodymium ratio uh, with core formation, even uh, with a large quantity of sulfur. And we tried to also to, to, to see this evaporation. Um, but I don't think so. In fact, it's always the, the difficulty because there was like um, the redox condition and the volatility. And in fact, the samarium, we change the valence. It will be europium, iterbium, and samarium. And it's also the same for the, vol for the volatility. But I don't think so. Uh, but we propose this model of collisional erosion. In this paper of Johnson et, et al., it's not the same model. They think that it's a difference of mineralogy and it's due to uh, the participation of, yeah, in, in reduced conditions, the mineralogy will be different. So we have two different uh, conclusions, but uh, we agree to say that we need to apply this, um, this high value for the samarium neodymium ratio for the Earth. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, we don't have any hands up or questions in the chat, but uh, so I'll give it a, a second. If anybody would like to ask another question, please go ahead. Okay. Thanks, Maud. This was great. Thank you. And thanks everybody for coming. Um, bye -bye. See... Thank you. Yeah, bye. We'll see you all next week for um, Ramos' talk on um, tectonic evolution of Benoscandy. All right, take care, everybody. Thank you.